Welcome as we gather tonight to worship God again, and if you're able, I invite you to rise. The psalmist says, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, and His steadfast love endures forever. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And as we come out into His presence, let's first prepare our hearts in a moment of silent prayer. Father, hear now the prayers of your people, even as we say together the prayer which Jesus himself taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. People of God, grace, and mercy, and peace be to you. From God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus, the Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're going to sing together from Psalm 46, God is our refuge and our strength.
And you'll notice as we're going through the service tonight that we, there's this consistent theme of how this comfort we find in our faith overcomes issues of fear. We turn also to Psalm 57. And the psalmist says, Be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to me, for in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge until the storms of destruction pass by. I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He will send from heaven and save me. He will put to shame him who tramples on me. God will send out his steadfast love and his faithfulness. My soul is in the midst of lions. I, I lie down amid fiery beasts. The children of man whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. They set a net for my steps. My soul was bowed down. They dug a pit in my way, but they have fallen into it themselves. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make melody. Awake, my glory. Awake, O harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is great to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. And then we're going to sing also, Our God, our help in ages past, verses 1, 2, 3, and 6. And then also some encouragement from 2 Timothy chapter 1. The Apostle Paul says, I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith. A faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. And for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. And therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, and nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, 
which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. Guard the good deposit entrusted to you. And then we're going to stand together and sing, Be Still, My Soul, in the celebration hymn number 712. Let's stand and sing together. We're going to turn tonight to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I had originally planned to have a, a quite a short section, but the more I looked at this passage, I think it all hangs together. I think we have to deal with it as one chunk, this whole chapter. Before we read, let's first come to our God in a word of prayer together. Heavenly Father, we come to you again eager, anticipating that every time we open your word, you will be there. You will reveal yourself. You will work in and through this word to accomplish all which you purpose. This word will never return to you empty. And so, Father, we come in that confidence and that hope that in this very time and place, you will assure us 
You will renew and restore and invigorate again our faith and our hope and our confidence, our comfort. And so, Father, we pray now that you would grant me words to speak, that you grant us all ears to hear, eyes to see, minds to understand, hearts to believe, all that you are and all that you promise and all that you call us to in Jesus' name. Amen. So 2 Thessalonians, beginning at chapter 2, clearly there was an issue that, that they had somehow communicated to Paul, and he was responding to that. He says, now, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to Him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And, and you know what is restraining him now, so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed." whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. And therefore God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false, in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this He called you through our gospel, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. And now may our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, Comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. So far, the reading of God's holy word. People of God, you you notice that the title of the sermon is Real Faith Over Real Fear. Of course, we've all seen those signs, faith over fear. They became very popular, uh, especially during uh, the kind of the height of the COVID pandemic. And it is certainly true that faith does indeed overcome fear. I was occasionally a little, a little hesitant, I must admit, about that slogan because I'm not sure that everybody really understood what that meant. It is certainly not true that having faith in God means that we are confident nothing bad will ever happen to us. It is not true that our faith will stop us from getting the disease. It is not true that our faith will stop us from dying. It's not that simple. And of course, if you think about it even for a few minutes, you realize the trouble of that. Because the implication is anybody who does get sick, anybody who does die, it must be their fault, because I guess they didn't have enough faith, which is a horrible thing to say to somebody, and it's a lie. And Jesus directly addresses that. You see, we don't live yet in a world with perfect justice. One day God will make that real, but we don't. When you do good things, it doesn't mean that good things will happen to you. When you do bad things, it doesn't mean you get instant karma. We don't believe in karma. We believe in divine justice. We live in a world where God sends rain on the just and the unjust. That's common grace. But we also live in a world 
where all kinds of people get cancer, the just and the unjust. We live under a common curse also. And so if, if what we mean by faith over fear is that I am confident that God will never let anything bad happen to me, that's bad theology, and you will be sorely disappointed. But if we mean by that that our faith gives us a hope which in every single way overcomes our current situations, that is certainly true. God does make real and powerful promises. We, we find the Thessalonians here terrified at first. I mean, they are afraid. They are really afraid. Now, I think as we kind of look at this passage, we can divide it into, I think, five headings here. We see there, there's a lie, there's the truth, there's, there's a comfort and confidence for them, there's a command, and then there's a final blessing. The lie, the truth, the comfort and confidence, the command, and the blessing. Uh, the problem seems to have been a fairly simple one. Somebody, either by a false prophecy or a false teaching, was saying something to the effect that the day of the Lord had already come. Now, at first glance, I must admit, it seemed like a very odd thing for them to be troubled by this. It's so obviously false. You'd think if Jesus returned, they would have noticed that kind of a thing. And yet, and yet they're terrified. I think one of the difficulties with fear in general is that it makes us irrational. Reason flies out the window. And that's not just a, an idea we have in our heads. It's a very real thing. Fear isn't just a spiritual thing. It has a physical component to it. In fact, in our brains, we have a, a part of the brain called the amygdala. It's the fear center. And if you're in mortal danger, then that amygdala fires, and it sends all kinds of signals to your body. It, it makes you laser focus on the issue at hand. It, all distractions are set aside. All other thoughts, there is nothing but that danger in front of you. It feels like time almost slows down. Adrenaline is released in massive amounts in your body, increasing your heart rate, flooding you with adrenaline, making your muscles wired and ready for action. And so you, you, you don't feel pain, you don't feel tired, you can, you can have extraordinary feats of strength. If you're on the battlefield, if your child is in danger, if you're being chased by a wild animal, these are wonderful reactions that could save your life. Here's the problem. If you have a threat that is merely mental, our bodies have the same reaction. Our, our bodies can't differentiate. And so, likewise, if we get worried about something, our brain says, you've got to be laser-focused, and all we can think about is that fear that's in front of us. It's, it's, all, it's all that's there. Everything else is gone. Our body gets filled with adrenaline, but we're not actually running. We're not in a battle. We're just sitting there, and so our bodies are wired. Often, that's what we might call an anxiety or a panic attack. You can't see straight. You can't think straight. They're wondering, what if Jesus returned and we missed it? In other words, what if Jesus returned and we are not, in fact, saved? Because they particularly use this phrase, it was the day of the Lord. That's an Old Testament term. And Isaiah 13, wail, for the day of the Lord is near, as destruction from the Almighty it will come. All hands will be feeble, every human heart will melt. Their faces will be aflame. The day of the Lord comes, cruel with wrath and fierce anger. Or the prophet Joel says, below a trumpet in Zion sound an alarm. Let the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is near. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. The sun and moon are darkened, the stars withdraw their shining. The day of the Lord is great and awesome. Who can endure it? That's something to fear, and they know it. That's a real fear, that the day of the Lord has come and you are standing under God's judgment. Paul Paul says, and it kind of a, it seems like a little aside, but it's actually a beautiful way of saying it. He says, when Jesus comes for you, it will not be to destroy you, but to gather you. That's a completely different way of thinking about it. That, that's the promise from Isaiah 40. Behold, the Lord God comes with might. His arm rules. His reward is with them. 
He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms, and he will carry them and gently lead those that are with young. That's, that's the real image Paul wants them to have. He has two, I think, concerns. He says he wants to make sure they're not quickly shaken in their mind and that they not be alarmed. Don't be shaken. Don't be alarmed. Not because nothing bad will ever happen on earth. It will. But because when God comes for you, He will know you and He loves you and He will come to gather you and tend and protect you as a shepherd not as a judge. And so the first thing Paul does is, to, is tell them the truth. He doesn't want anybody to be, to be deceived in any way. He says there's, there's no chance the day of the Lord has come. And particularly in this case, he gives one particular item, he says, that has to happen first. And he talks about what is called here the the man of lawlessness elsewhere, the Antichrist. Now, there's, there's almost nothing said about this character, this figure. First John 2 says, this is the last hour. You have heard that Antichrist is coming. Even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it's the last hour. And in both those passages, there seems to be this force or spirit at work in the world between the first and the second comings of Christ in these last days. This, this spirit, what, what John calls the spirit of Antichrist, and Paul calls it the secret power of lawlessness. But, but these things will somehow culminate in a, in a final figure at some point. Now, the difficulty is that's all we know. Some people are obsessed with this idea. They make lists and diagrams and schedules and timelines, and they want to connect all the dots and put together this jigsaw. They want some secret knowledge that gives them, they think, power to handle this future. But God doesn't give us those details. I think that's on purpose. I think apocalyptic literature like this, it's more like impressionist painting. It's, it's not realism. It just gives you an impression of the reality, almost just a feeling about it. That's enough. But I think what he says is, is enough for us. Now, when will these things happen? He doesn't say. We know it'll happen before the end. Shall we sit here and identify all the criteria so we can predict his coming to the day? In 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul says basically, I'm not going to talk to you about dates and times, about when Christ comes back. He's going to come like a thief in the night. And of course, Paul heard that from Jesus himself. I don't want you to be obsessed, he says, with with identifying the nearness or the farness of Jesus' return. Jesus says that not even he knows that date. Not even the angels know, only the Father. And so if Jesus doesn't know, if the angels don't know, if Paul doesn't know, I'm pretty confident that, that the guy on TV doesn't know, that that woman who wrote the book doesn't know. We should always be ready because we know it's near. But we don't panic about it. We don't even have to worry about it. And it's defined particularly by this, this idea of lawlessness here. In the Greek, that's the word anomia. Now, nomos is the Greek word for law, and this prefix ah negates the word. We have that too in English. You can be happy or unhappy. The un negates the word. You can have dairy or non-dairy. The non negates the word. And so this is in the Greek, a, a man who was without law, no law. And it's interesting, I think, in this particular case, because this is actually something that we can begin to see for the first time in history, in our culture particularly. And people aren't saying any more like they by and large used to. I know this is wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway. In other words, I acknowledge that there is a law, and I acknowledge that I'm going to break the law. That's one thing. That's a spirit of rebellion. But now people are saying, well, who's to say what's right and wrong? Now people are saying there really is no law at all. And that's new. 
You know, when Martin Luther King Jr. was in jail, he wrote a letter from the Birmingham jail. And he says, a just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of God. And he says, in terms of St. Aquinas, an unjust law is a human law that is not rooted in eternal law and natural law. And so when he thought about civil disobedience, he particularly noted, well, we're not really breaking the law because that law is not in conformity with the eternal law. That's not lawlessness. That's following the real law. He says, I know it's an unjust law because there's an eternal law, an absolute law that I not only have to believe, but I have to call everybody on the face of this earth also to obey it. But nobody, nobody talks like that anymore. Lawlessness says, my feelings are more real than any law outside of me. That's the new law. It's a completely different worldview. Only I can say what's right or wrong for me, and, and I say nothing's wrong. And that, I think, is actually genuinely new. You know, C.S. Lewis has a book called The Abolition of Man. It's just a short little book. And he says, for the first time in the history of the world... Intellectuals are saying every moral judgment is rooted not in eternal law, but in my feelings. And he says that up until the 1930s or the 1940s, every society, every culture, everywhere in the world, always, they said that moral judgments were true, they were rooted in something eternal. There was this absolute system of values which said murder is wrong, lying is wrong, theft is wrong. It's wrong to disrespect the elderly. It's wrong to be selfish. It's wrong to be greedy. It was seen by all moral and religious centers and cultures in every century, in every part of the world, until now. We're living in the, for the first time in history where there's not merely rebellion, but lawlessness. And apparently at some time... The, this will culminate in the lawless one being revealed. What will happen then? Do we have to be afraid that this lawlessness is going to win? Do we have to be afraid that the lawless one will win? Do we have to be afraid that Satan will win? I'm amazed how, <laughs> how absolutely and utterly confident Paul is here. He says, do you think I'm worried about that? The lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. Jesus' mere breath, Jesus' mere presence will utterly destroy him and all of his works. Because this lawless one is not God. Despite his lies and claims, he's as nothing. His works will be as nothing. His spirit is as nothing. It will come to nothing. In fact, it says, all will be condemned who did not believe the truth. In fact, there's really all kinds of parallels in this passage. There's, there's this lawless man being revealed and Jesus being revealed. There's the lies of the Spirit that are spoken words or letters versus, versus the truth. The destruction of the wicked and the glory of the elect. Particularly this idea of, of refusing to love the truth or the salvation for those who do believe in the truth. But certainly we can see the judgment of God on the lawless versus the blessing of God on those whom he loves. The coming to nothing of evil's work versus, at the very end of our text, the establishment of every good work and word. What comfort is there in this face of this trouble? What does Paul tell the church in Thessalonica? I think verses 13 and 14 are just packed with hope. Paul is so pastorally, he doesn't even command these things. He's just asking, he's just pleading with them. That's rare for him. He's usually a pretty bold guy. He's so gentle here. Talking to his brothers and sisters in the faith whom he loves, not only those loved by him, but those who are beloved by the Lord. And he gives this wonderful Trinitarian promise. He says, we are comforted and confident. Why? Because God chose you. 
as first fruits to be saved. Because you are saved by the Spirit sanctifying you in belief in the truth. Because we have been called to this gospel to obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. The first note of comfort and confidence is because God chose you. The canons of Dorothy say election is God's unchangeable purpose by which he, before the foundation of the world, by sheer grace, according to the free good pleasure of his will, chose in Christ to salvation a definite number of particular people out of the entire human race. And those chosen were neither better nor more deserving than others. They lay with him in the common misery. But God did this in Christ, whom he appointed from eternity to be the mediator, the head of all those chosen, the foundation of their salvation. And God decreed to give to Christ those chosen for salvation, to call and draw them effectively into Christ's fellowship. How? Through the Word and the Spirit. God decreed to grant them true faith in Christ, to justify them, to sanctify them, and finally, after powerfully preserving them in the fellowship of the Son, to glorify them. See, we can be comforted and confident because we aren't relying on our, our fickle conduct. We're not relying on our meager strength. We're not relying on our paltry wisdom because our confidence rests in God's eternal and unchanging decree. The, the, the saint can say, let the winds howl, let the storms come. The rock on which I stand is unmovable. This is so absolutely critical. I, I was kind of amazed this week. As just a brief aside. There's been a kind of a, a debate happening between pastors in our denomination, and a retired pastor um, in particular has been writing articles, and he wrote this week about his, well, already his disdain for what he calls the new Calvinism, this young, restless, and reform movement, and this entire movement that includes really the Gospel Coalition and um, Together for the Gospel and, and all these, these groups, including um, the Abide Project and the conservative half of our denomination. He has disdain for it, and he, and he thinks we're all completely wrong because he, because he says, what a silly idea that God is, is this kind of a sovereign God from eternity. That seems to make him so arbitrary and so cold and so calculating. Who could believe in such a God? And I would ask, who would want to believe in any other God? Would we want to believe in a God that is out of control? Would we want to believe in a God that is helpless? Would we want to believe in a God that has to look outside himself for what is right or what is wrong or what he should do or what he can do. That's a terrifying thought. Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. And the difficulty is that they, they confuse those things because they think that God's nature is arbitrary. When we say that God does whatever he wants, we don't mean that he can do anything. We don't mean that he can commit evil. He, he does those things only which are part of his nature. He does those things which are consistent with, with who He is, and we know that He is good. He is perfect. He is righteous in all His ways. He is holy. He is faithful. He is filled with steadfast love and kindness. He is just and merciful. This is the God who decrees. This is the God who acts. This is the God who creates. This is the God who saves. And as part of that, that election, God promises to work out all the details of that salvation in our lives, in, in time. And it says that the means by which He makes that election present is through the Spirit and by faith. He sends His Spirit and His Word to enact what He has decreed. The Holy Spirit sanctifies us from beginning to end. The Spirit moves us to believe the truth, which means that there's a real truth. And knowing that truth gives your real faith the ability to overcome real troubles and real fears. And it also means that the more you know that truth, the more you know that truth, the more confidence and hope you'll have. Knowing the Scriptures is the very best way to overcome fears. And this election made present by the Spirit through faith leads to this amazing conclusion here. That somehow it says this gospel brings us to that day where we, we will obtain the glory 
of our Lord Jesus Christ. How can we even begin to comprehend such a thing? Not even merely glory in the sense of, of fame or recognition or renown or honor or prestige, though those things will happen too. That God Himself will look upon you one day and say, with all creation looking on as witness, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the rest of your master. That God Himself will honor us publicly and vindicate us. We will have in that sense renown and fame, but, but far more than that. This is the word that, that is reserved in the Old Testament for God's own glory. And we get these, these amazing promises that He will somehow transform our lowly bodies to be like His glorious body, that our bodies will be sown in dishonor and raised in glory, that with unveiled faces beholding the glory of the Lord, we will be transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, that we are being prepared for this eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, that, that the sufferings of this present time can't even be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. That when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. That's, that's the end. That's the destiny. It's inevitable. And therefore, Paul says, stand firm in that hope. Now you can stand. Don't be, don't be weighed down by the temporary problems of the world. And he says the best way to do that is by, by holding on. He's, he uses the word here, the traditions that you were taught. No, he's not talking about human traditions. He's referring back to the gospel that he preached to them. Hold on to what you were taught about Jesus from the Scriptures. Stand firm in the faith. Stand firm in the Lord. For our Lord Jesus Christ himself, with God our Father, through the presence and power of his Spirit, the very one, he says, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, he himself will comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. He has chosen by grace to love you. And in His Son, He has shown you and enacted that love. And in His Spirit, He unites you to that love. The comfort He gives is not the, uh, just a sip of water to a dying man. It says He gives everlasting comfort, perfect comfort, comfort without end, comfort in life and in death. He gives you good hope, absolute confidence, that He will never fail in what He purposes. I wonder if we can say with Paul, yes, I'm being poured out as a drink offering. Sure, the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And henceforth there is, I know it. I am sure of it. There is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me when on that day. The day of the Lord is nothing that I'm afraid of. That's the day I get my crown. That's the day I get to see him. Not only to me, but to all who have loved his appearing. Should we be terrified of the Antichrist, of the spirit of lawlessness? Are we doomed? Also, oh, not even a little bit, not even close. Now, and that doesn't mean the bad things won't happen in this world, because they can and do. The question they would say, do we need to be afraid of them? If we don't have to be afraid of the greatest things, do we have to be afraid of the lesser things? Or maybe we can flip that question around. Maybe as we close, what should we be afraid of? If we don't need to be afraid of the most terrifying person in the most terrifying time in history, what should we fear? What's the worst thing that could happen? See, the worst thing that could happen is not failing a test. The worst thing that could happen is not that you didn't make the team, that you were embarrassed, that you got dumped, that you lost your job. The worst thing that can happen isn't even getting sick. It's not war coming. It's not being homeless. It's not even dying. You know, Jesus says in Matthew 10, Do not fear. Do not fear those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather... Fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And he's not talking about Satan. We have this weird idea from culture that Satan somehow is the king of hell. And that God is buying Satan off to redeem us. It's nonsense. Satan has no rights. 
Satan is in hell as a prisoner, not as a guard. He himself has been defeated and conquered, and he himself is cast into hell. He has no power over us. He can't destroy your soul and body. Only, only God can. Don't worry about people who can merely kill your body. God can make you a new body. He will make you a new body. He says, don't worry about earthly powers. Don't even be afraid, the Scriptures say, of sickness and death. Not even of Satan and the demons. The only person we have to ultimately fear is God Himself. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Only God has the power to send you to hell. And what, what does God do with His power to judge? In John 5, 5, Jesus says, For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. All judgment has been given to Jesus, the very one who lived for us and who died for us. And so Paul concludes in Romans 8, Well, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus. He's the only one who can condemn you. The one who died. And more than that, the one who was raised, the very one who was at the right hand of God, who was interceding for us. And so Paul can conclude in that chapter, therefore I consider the sufferings of this present time, they can't even be compared, they're not worth comparing. What a waste of time to compare these measly, tiny, insignificant sufferings with that glory. Not because the sufferings are so small, because the glory is so big. We eagerly wait for that glory to be revealed. And in the meantime, he says, the Spirit is going to help us in our weakness. And furthermore, Jesus is in the meantime reigning over all all things. We know that for those who love God, all things will work together for good. Those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. And those whom he predestined, he called. And those whom he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he glorified. He doesn't even say he will glorify them. He's done it. It's a done deal. And so he asked that final question, well, then if God is for us, who can be against us? You name, you name one person in this entire universe that could be against you if God is for you. Not Satan, not a demon, not the man of lawlessness, not a CEO, not a military commander, not a politician. Nobody. Nobody. Nothing, not life and not death, not angels, not rulers, not things present nor things to come, not height nor depth, not powers, nothing in fact in all of creation can ever, ever separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do we believe that? That's a faith that can overcome fear. It doesn't mean that nothing bad will happen. In fact, The Bible is pretty honest that bad things will happen. In fact, Christians will be persecuted. We will have to suffer for the name's sake. It's a fact it's an honor to do so. We live in a world under the curse. But, he says, you've been chosen by God for a glorious ending. You've been born again by the Spirit into this living faith. You are destined for glory. The very worst thing the world can do to you is kill you, kill your body. And that just hastens the glory. Paul even says at one point, in fact, I desire to depart and be with Christ. That's far better. And so as we close, how can you know? How can you know that's for you? 1 John tells us, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we've seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. And whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him and He in God. And so we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in Him. And by this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Why? Because fear has to do with punishment. 
Whoever fears has not been perfected in love. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation. There is no punishment. And so John says, therefore, we should have no fear. Perfect love casts out fear. Not so much our love for God, but God's love for us. Are you in that love? Let me ask this question maybe. Are you afraid of the right things? Are you afraid of the right person? Are you afraid of God? Or are you afraid of man? And if your fear is rightly placed, do you know if God is for you? If, if God loves you? Because in His Son, He is offered to do that very thing. Do you believe Him? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we, we live yet in a world where there are real troubles, where there are, from our perspective, real dangers, real anxieties and pressures, and yet, Father, so often we are laser-focused on only what is before us, and we forget. We forget Your power. We forget Your love. We forget your decrees. We forget that you have chosen us. That you have sent your own spirit to be within us and to grant us saving faith in your Son. And that your purpose for us is to give us the glory of Jesus Christ himself. And these light and momentary afflictions are merely preparing us for that glory. One day we'll realize they weren't even worth comparing with that glory. And so, Father, keep us focused on the right things. Make us afraid of the right things. Make us confident in the right things. Make us faithful in the right things. Help us to, to stand firm to the right things, to hold fast to the right things. In other words, to hold fast to you and to your word and to your truth by faith. In your Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing together, He Leadeth Me, number 440. Let's stand and sing.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of faith which you work within us by your Spirit. And we thank you for having called us to yourself and for consecrating us to your service. Father, we pray for the church, gathered from every nation and family and people and tongue, to be a kingdom of priests to serve you. And so, Father, we pray for the church all around the world, for large churches and small churches, for churches that are meeting in, in large public buildings and for those who had, that are meeting in secret, for the church where she is persecuted and the church where she is free, for the church where she is strong and the church where she is weak. And we pray, Father, that you might grant to your church not only genuine faith, but strong faith and strong hope and much joy, even in affliction, that you might fill your church with a zeal for your word, with a passion for the gospel, with a love for the lost. That, Father, you might grow your church, that you might protect your church, that you might fulfill all your purposes for her. Father, we pray for those whom you've entrusted with, with your church. We pray for pastors and elders and deacons. We pray for lay leaders and volunteers and committees. Father, we thank you for Reverend Petrolia and Marcia and for their ongoing work in our congregation, for their faithfulness and their love for your people. Will you bless them and watch over them and, and encourage them? May they indeed find much joy in the way in which they serve you and us. Father, we thank you for all of those who serve on council here, who you have ordained to represent you, to love your people in your name, to be under shepherds. And so, Father, grant them a, an extra measure of your spirit that they might serve well and guide your people. Father, we pray for all of those who serve you here in so many ways, some public and some done in secret and at home in a closet as they pray diligently. But Father, particularly as we begin a new church here, as we anticipate all of our classes and organizations and Bible studies and clubs starting again, as we look forward to gathering, to learning, to growing, to serving together, Will you bless all of those preparations and all of those who are doing the preparing, all of those whom you have called and who have agreed to serve. Father, we thank you for each of them. Will you guide them in that work? Father, we lift up the nations of the world and we pray for peace. We think especially yet of Ukraine and that ongoing war. Father, will you bring an end to that? We pray yet for Kenya and for relief from the drought there. Father, we pray for our nation and for those who lead it for the President, for the Congress, for the Senate, for all of those who work around the world representing us, who negotiate for peace and justice. Father, we pray for our own congregation, for those who have special needs, for those who are suffering from sickness or weakness or from the ravages of old age. We pray, Father, for health and strength. For all of those who are disturbed or troubled, troubled will you give rest and understanding to those who are lonely or alienated, grant them fellowship and love. To those who grieve and who are filled with sorrow, will you grant comfort and assurance. To those who are aged and frail, will you give homes of comfort and safety. Father, whatever our needs are, will you answer them and have mercy upon us. And Father, we will present these requests to you. A Father of mercy in the name of Jesus Christ the one who is even now seated at your right hand and interceding for us, the very one who will come on the last trumpet to gather us into your holy dwelling place. And Father, we long for that day, and we pray, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. And then as we leave, we're going to stand and sing the Apostles' Creed. In God the Father, I believe. Let's stand and sing that together.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his countenance towards you and give you his peace. And all God's people say, Amen.